Welcome, everybody. We're excited to have you here with us for our 12th and final uh, Mountain States Concrete Pipe Academy presentation. With me uh, is Mr. Mike Blackham from Geneva Pipe and Precast. I'm Jason Allen with uh, Old Castle Infrastructure. We're going to actually tag team this and each is going to talk about a different aspect of uh, reinforced concrete pipe inspection and repair. Just a couple of housekeeping items before I turn the time over to Mike. Um, just a, a just a little reminder of what is the Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association. Well, we're made up of, of multiple companies here. We've got uh, Geneva Pipe and Precast and Old Castle Infrastructure, who, uh, as I mentioned, Mike from Geneva and, and I'm with Old Castle. We also want to recognize Ashgrove and Wholesome, who have helped out and given some presentations this year in our uh, webinars, and, and they are our cement suppliers. And so just a quick reminder, we do uh, pr provide technical assistance for reinforced concrete pipe and, and precast concrete industry. We work very closely with engineers and specifiers, inspectors, and installers. Uh, we we also give a lot of presentations. We attend a lot of conferences. We we give webinars. Uh, we'll do lunch and learn. So if you want more information on what we're talking about today or anything that we've talked about or, or a, speci a specific topic, feel free to reach out to Mike or myself. I'm going to put our contact information up at the end so that you can uh, you can see what that is. And, and if you want more information, we'd be happy to come into your office and bring you lunch and and give a presentation. Uh, another thing that we do is write and re review specifications. So we're going to be talking uh, about specifications today. It's a little bit specification heavy presentation. So uh, if you want more information or need help with some stuff, feel free to let us know. Uh, we also answer any constructability or design questions. So uh, another reminder that time is running out. You only have until the end of the month and then it's the end of this year. And that's when all of these webinars that we've given this year uh, all 12 of them will be available until December 20, uh, December 31st. So make sure that you you get those in and that you watch those so you can get credit for them. You go to mountainstates.concretepipe.org slash academy and you can uh, click to register for any of the past webinars. I will have this webinar uploaded uh, within about an hour after it uh, after we, we finish it. So you'll be able to get on and, and watch any of those. Uh, that we've done and remember that you get a great prize this is uh you get to choose one of your prizes if you watch 10 out of the 12 uh we'll go ahead and we'll reach out to those that that watch 10 out of 12 i'll run those numbers on january 1st and determine who watched at least 10 out of the 12 and you can choose one of these shirts i'll reach out to you via email and find out what shirt you want what size and then we'll we'll get some cool shirts printed up for you so um as i mentioned before uh mike blackham with us uh mike always radiates positivity um, Mike is going to be talking today about Ashto. The spec he's going to focus on is Ashto R73, which is your pre-installation uh, specification. So what we do with repairing and inspecting concrete pipe before it goes in the ground. And then after Mike's complete, I will talk about ASTM C1840, a national specification that is about post-installation. So what to do with pipe uh, after it's already in the ground, what's acceptable, what is not. So Without any further ado, we'll go ahead and uh, turn some time over to Mike. So I'm going to throw the screen over to you, Mike, and I will make you the new presenter. Great. Thank you, Jason. Okay. Let's see. Is everyone, are you seeing this okay? Looks like it. Okay. So as Jason mentioned, I'm going to talk about ASHTO R73, which is the inspection and evaluation of concrete pipe before installation. So there's kind of two main aspects. Well, there's multiple main aspects of inspection of pipe we'll get into. But the two things Jason and I are going to talk about, as he mentioned, are what should you look for at the plant or after delivery before you put the pipe in? And then what should you look at after installation, which is what Jason will touch on. Uh, both of these topics could probably take a full hour on their own. So we are both gonna do our best to get through this. And if there are any questions or you want more details, as usual, you can reach out to either one of us. Let's see, there we go. Okay, so important inspection milestones. So as mentioned, there's a lot of times that we should be looking at our product, looking at our RCP. During our production phase, we should be watching what we're doing and inspecting the pipe. Um, Pre-installation phase, during installation, you should be watching what you're doing, and then post-installation. All of these times are important and critical times where you could be looking at your product and potentially save a lot of hassle and headache um, catching things along the way rather than maybe just waiting till the very, very end. 
pre-installation RCP. That's what I'm gonna mostly focus on here during my time. Why is that important? Well, I would say the most important reason for pre-installation RCP is if you have issues before the pipe goes in the ground and you've installed it, you could catch those issues before you ever put the pipe in and save yourself a lot of time and hassle um, of problems you might see on a post-installation inspection. So it could save a lot of time and money for everyone, for the contractor, for the owner, for the manufacturer, for everyone. So that I'd say that's the biggest reason why it's really, really important. And with that, we will do our first poll question to see who's paying attention. All righty, I'm launching that right now. The question is, in your experience, which of the following are the most common issues that cause concern prior to installation of reinforced concrete pipe? Damaged bells and spigots or head damage, poor consolidation of concrete in the pipe walls, cracks in the pipe wall, exposed steel in the pipe wall, or rough surface on the interior of the pipe. So feel free to, to vote there. Um, we'll leave this open for about 20, 25 seconds more and give you guys a chance to vote. Got about half of you in. If you if you're in full screen mode, make sure you uh, you come out of full screen mode because sometimes it won't let you click on anything if you're in full screen mode. So okay, we've got about two thirds of you. We'll give you about ten more seconds here. This will be interesting to see what everybody what everyone's experience is. This is interesting here. Okay, five, four, three, two, one, and. We'll close it and share it. All right. Well, it looks like a majority um, said damaged bells and spigots or end damage. Another one, um, about a fourth of them said cracks in the pipe wall and and a uh, small percentage says poor, uh, poor consolidation. That should say poor consolidation. I apologize. In the concrete pipe wall. So um, obviously the, the overwhelming majority, Mike, said damaged bells and spigots or end damage. Yep, and that you know that doesn't surprise me. I thought there might be a little more on the cracks in the pipe wall, but mm -hmm. um, I, I've seen a lot of damaged bells and spigots in the in the field as well. And I think a lot of times I, I don't want to point fingers per se, but a lot of times if the contractor doesn't offload the pipe properly, uh, that's what you'll see, that, or or even store it. Sometimes the the contractor will take it off the truck and put it, you know, put it out in the Build somewhere and kind of just stage it, stage the pipe and get it ready for for maybe installation the following week. And you know maybe they're driving along a really bumpy road or whatever. But handling handling is the main reason for those damaged spigots and bells. Um, I would say for the most part. What, what would your thoughts be there, Jason? I I agree. I think I think for the most part, what I go out and get called out on, or when we see pipes getting rejected and kicked back, it's mostly uh, damage on the on the ends of it. Uh, we try to do our best in the plant to make sure that we're not sending pipe out that's uh, that, that's damaged or cracked. And so if there is something in transit, it seems like unloading, loading and unloading is where you see a lot of the majority. Maybe they're not they're not protecting as well as they should when they're taking it off the truck. And so yeah, that's I would say the end damage. I'm not surprised that a majority said end damage. That's it's pretty common. Yep. Yep. So I'm I'm glad it went that direction because uh, the spec I'm the specification I'm going to talk about today, Ashto R73, believe it or not, covers the two top items that everyone has seen: damage to your spigots and bells and cracks in pipe. Uh, this is just some pictures that says really there is no reason for this. You know, here's some video inspection. This could have been during installation. It could have been during. Uh, it could have been damage beforehand just some pictures of some damaged pipe though really there's no no reason to have this is kind of the main point there so when and who should inspect pipe for damage on a job site I think it's a pretty uh pretty open-ended question and I would hope that the answer is pretty pretty straightforward but the reality is everyone and anyone should be inspecting it and they should be inspecting it during all phases of installation, um, trucking, sitting in, in the yard or in the job site. Really, anyone can go out and take five minutes and look at concrete pipe and pretty quickly tell if there's some problems or there are going to be some problems. 
And a good thing to look for are the two items that people said they are seeing most common. Look for your damaged spigots and bells. Look for cracks in pipe. Those are the two biggest issues that people are seeing and also the two biggest things that you can quickly identify. So it's not hard to do at all. And with that, we have another poll question. All right, this says, do your current specifications address the issue of inspection and acceptance of pipe prior to installation? Yes, no, or I am unsure. And you know, Jason, this is actually a pretty good question because I know we really push for post-installation inspection and mm -hmm. that's been a main focus um, of ours as a, as a group. But to be honest, I don't know that we've pushed for a, a pre-installation inspection. Yeah, that's, we'll that's about a good it. point. You know, we, we've done, what we have done as an association is uh, we've given contractor trainings over the last a few years, started those in 2018, did them in 2018 and 19, took a year off last year and this year. We'll probably start those back up next year is the plan, but um, giving contractor training to help educate the contractors on how to, you know, proper handling and making sure that the, the, the pipes are, are being handled well so that we eliminate or, or reduce the amount of damage that we're seeing. But um, you're right, we, we've tried to do what we can on the front end with the contractors, but as far as specifications, you're 100% you're right. I don't know that we've pushed that too much. So uh, I'll go ahead and share this. And it looks like a majority said uh, yes. There were a few oh, that great. said no. And then about 30% uh, that said, I'm, I'm not sure. So, That's so great. Um, yeah, not not bad. We we definitely want to see more than fifty percent uh, having this in their specifications. Yeah, I, I think it's a good, easy, quick uh, reassurance for yourself to maybe head off some problems that you might have later. So, pre-installation inspection in your specs. Someone might say, "Well, what what do we do? How do we do it?" Believe it or not, you can use a national standard. Here's an example that's being used um, quite frequently around the country, actually. And you can read it real quick, but it just says RCP shall be inspected and accepted for use or repair in accordance to the AASHTO R73 prior to installation. And I'm going to dig into that here in just a little bit, uh, in just a little bit here. So pretty, pretty quick and easy to, to put a spec in there in your own specifications. What is AASHTO R73? So that is my biggest focus here. It's an evaluation guideline that AASHTO has written, and it has been written actually by uh, national DOTs and accepted, and it evaluates cracks, joints, uh, joint damage, and manufacturing defects. And it also gives guidelines and solutions to whether or not those problems are acceptable, repairable, or should be rejected. So it's a really, really well-written specification that, that can easily be used by about anyone when you look at it. So let, let's get into it just a little bit here real quick. Uh, here's one section right here, and as you can see, there's pictures, there's examples, they've done a really good job. So in one section, it talks about acceptable cracks for reinforced pipe. And it tells you a single end crack that does not exceed the depth of the joint, and it refers to a figure. So it specifically tells you where and when and how a crack can form to have it be acceptable without any kind of repair just sitting in your yard. And here's kind of a zoomed in view of it. And again, like I said, we could really go in, uh, in depth and detail with all these, but for time's sake, we're gonna kind of go through this fairly quickly to give you the kind of the gist of what this is. And then we can go into more details if you want. Uh, here's some surface cracking pictures. It shows kind of a surface crack on the outside of the pipe. This is very common also, and it gives you an acceptable criteria for not only pipe, which I forgot to mention this, the Ashto R73 is for more than just RCP. It actually has sections for box culvert as well and has all these details and for any drainage vault product. So you can see right there, 4.4 says acceptable cracks for precast concrete other than pipe. So it actually gives you uh, a lot of uh, a lot of guidance. Here's another section that talks about repairable defects in precast concrete pipe. 
So I'll go back to that picture. You can kind of see there, there's a, looks like a little void or a chip or some kind of damage. And we won't read through it all again. I know there's a lot of information on here, but you can go back and, and look at this in detail later. But it talks about cracks. It talks about uncured manufacturing defects, surface defects. So it gives you good guidance on what can be repairable. So in this section, it's saying, here are the items or the amount of damage that could be repairable. Okay, and then here's, oh, there we go. So here's some in, about a box culvert. You have rejectable defects in precast concrete products. So this section, section six, is gonna help you determine when is it just rejectable? If I, if I have something show up on my job site and the crack is this large or the damage is this large, should I and can I just reject it and send it back to the manufacturer? And here's, here's a very, very basic statement at the beginning, but defects which will affect the function or design life of the product and cannot be adequately repaired. That's a pretty vague statement. Uh, it gets into more details in each section hereafter, but Anytime you look at a product, I think this is just telling you, if you look at it and it's gonna affect the function of the pipe, it probably should be rejected. So if you don't feel good about it and you think, hey, this pipe can't even function because there's a big hole in it, you're probably right. And here's a cause for rejection on a crack. Uh, any crack that is visibly passing through the wall of the product except for a single end crack and does not exceed the joint, uh, the depth of the joint. So what does some of this mean? Here again are some good pictures it refers to and it shows uh, rejectable pipes with cracks that go all the way through the wall. It exceeds that 01 inch crack that we always talk about and 12 inches in length. So it does a really good job giving some pictures and diagrams to look at and compare what you have with some pretty straightforward um, numbers to look at and compare to. So here's a couple conditions. You can see the two conditions that you really look for in pipe. Um, condition one, is there any visible crack passing through the wall? If the crack goes through the entire wall, um, it needs to be repaired at a minimum and potentially could be rejectable. And it tells you in here when you should reject it and when you should repair it. And then the second condition is a crack of at least 01 inch wide and at least 12 inches long even though it does not pass through the wall. So if you just have an outside crack that's an 01 crack and longer than 12 inches, you should also evaluate that and at a minimum repair it. Here's another section, talks about end damage, um, which is one of the things that we talked about that was the number one item you guys are seeing. So it gives some pictures and it talks about a single fracture or spall and the joint not exceeding three inches. Um, again, I, I'm not gonna read through all this, but this gives you some criteria and shows you, is this little chip at the very end, is that a problem? You can go right to the section and look and see what it says about that. Uh, um, here are some chipped bells, and well, these are all chipped spigots, but this is probably normal of what we see uh, in the field or that you might see, not normal, but when you do see some problems. Just some more verbiage specifications in there. Again, you can all go back and look at this and, and really read through it or you can buy the specification. But the cool thing about like damaged area uh, as you read through that is it talks about how much of the joint is damaged. Um, and there's a guidance of how much is allowed before you. they say it's gone too far, you can't repair it anymore. And there's actually even beyond that, a table at the end so that you don't have to do math. So right here's a permissible repair criteria for damage and chipped ends. So this table is for a non-gasketed joint, which most of our pipe here in Utah are gasketed, but for a non-gasketed 12 inch pipe, that first line, it says you can have up to 18 and a half inches length of damage going around that pipe. And as long as not one single damaged part is longer than nine inches long, you can repair it. So pretty, pretty nice tables there to, 
help you out with the math. Uh, here's some more just criteria on damage, uh, damage and chips to the ends, talking about fractures again. You can tell this is pretty pretty easily rejectable if it's damaged. That looks like it's damaged more than well, about 50% of the spigot probably, but it also goes all the way down into the pipe. But overall, as you can see, as I've quickly just gone through there, each section has details on what should be accepted as is because it's not a big deal. And Jason's gonna talk a little more on why that is. Uh, what you should look at and evaluate and maybe put a repair to it. And each manufacturer should have a written repair procedure for each one of those. And what is cause for rejection? So what? with all that being said, what are the tools on the job site you should have to evaluate per the specification? Well, it's pretty easy. You should have a copy of Ashto R73 handy. You should have your tape measure. You should have a little crack gauge and possibly a filler gauge. So with all that being said, we're gonna have a little interactive poll here. We're gonna put some pictures on the screen and we're gonna see what you would say, um, what your thoughts are on if this should be repaired, accepted as is, or rejected. Now I know you don't have the Ashto R73 in front of you, so we're gonna kind of just do this shooting from the hip. So let's look at the first one. Is this picture, we'll look at it for just a second and then Jason will pop up the poll. Do you think this should be acceptable as is, repairable or rejected if this showed up on your job site? Okay, I'll go ahead and launch that. And you tell us what you think. Okay, we'll give it about 10 more seconds here. Most have voted. And uh, after you show the results, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Jason, and see what you think. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, like where you, I like your style. I like your style, my friend. Oh, okay, let's, sorry, I got distracted there. Um, all right, it says uh, about a little bit more than half said acceptable. 40% uh, said repairable, and um, a handful said reject it, okay? Great, what, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, I would say that is, that is a minor chip, that would be acceptable, as is. Let's, all right, let's see what the specification says. Ooh, one for one, Jason's right. So based okay. on Ashto R73, this is acceptable. Now, wh why would you say, Oops, why would you say that's acceptable? Uh, it's It won't affect the function. It isn't actually, there's really no damage to where the joint and the gasket needs to seal. So it's not gonna be, it's definitely not a structural issue um, where it's not inside and there's no major cracking. The, there's not gonna have any issue of the gasket sealing. So it should be, um, it shouldn't affect the function of it as well. So it's mostly just aesthetic. So that would be acceptable. Perfect. You, you couldn't have answered it better. As you can see, the pipe where the gasket goes is on the inside of that bell, so it, it's not going to be a sealing issue. There's no reinforcing exposed, so it's not a structural issue. Mm -hmm. And really, it's it's nowhere on the inside of the pipe. It's just on the outside part of the pipe. Right. So according to Ashto R73, and this will zoom in here, acceptable damage and chips to ends. Um, it did not exceed three inches. The length wasn't more than two inches. And I know, again, that's hard to tell. Uh, this is just a picture. And that, that actually brings up a really good point there too that I wanna bring up. If you're gonna send a picture to somebody and ask for an evaluation on a piece of pipe or any concrete product for that matter, it goes a long ways to have a reference point. Because when you look back at that picture, yeah, it, it looks like a small chip and there's nothing exposed and it's not on the surface of the where the ceiling gasket goes. But really, 
we don't know for sure. We have a good guess of what that probably was, but what if that was a 96 inch pipe? It obviously wasn't, but what if it was a huge pipe and a huge damage, but it was zoomed in and you just don't know. And this even gets into post-installation inspection. I'm gonna just make one comment and cheat a little bit here into Jason's uh, half of his, but it's the same thing. If you send a video camera through for a post-installation inspection, please have some sort of measuring reference point so that when you zoom into those joint gaps, when you zoom into those cracks, you can really see how big those are. I, I can't tell you how many times I get pictures from my salesman on a job site before the pipe goes in. Hey, look at this crack, is this okay? And it might look like the Grand Canyon, but it's because he zoomed in and put the camera an inch from the crack and I just stick a pencil on there, put your finger in there, do something just to give a little bit of reference and, and I promise it'll help out a lot. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Uh, here's number two. This is a bell, uh, bell again on a pipe. Little bit bigger damage. So this one might be a little more tricky. Again, it's hard because we don't know the size and we don't have a tape measure, but Give me your best guess. What do you think on this one? So you can launch the poll. Five more seconds to look at it before I launch the poll because you, then you won't be able to see it. So take a good look at it, make your decision, and now I will launch. So again, your, your best judgment based on what you see. If I had to guess, just to give some hints, just kind of looking at the the radius there and the circumference of how much that is in the pipe. Oh, I'd say that might be, I don't know, less than 10% around the pipe, maybe, or right around 10% of that bell, if I had to guess. Okay, and let's see what everybody said. Uh, a little bit more than half said repairable and a little bit more than half said, or a little bit less than half said reject. So. Awesome. Jason, you're on the on the hook again. What do you say? You know, this one this one's an interesting one because the steel is exposed, um, and so that that makes you think, oh man, they're still exposed. That's not good. Um, keep in mind that that steel that is exposed right there, that's that's in a part of the pipe that doesn't isn't necessarily taking all of the structural load, right? It's not in the barrel of it. This is in the at the end in the in the bell. Um, I would say because it is only about, I, I estimated about 10 to 15% of the total circumference as well. Uh, I would say that is that is repairable. All right, let's see what uh, let's see what R73 says. Yeah, shoot me, got to shoot. There we go. R73 says it is repairable. So Jason is two for two. Well done. Not bad. Now why is that repairable? Here is, let's go back to the, the section that talks about this. And we had to look at the gasketed joints because we're gonna assume that was a gasketed joint, but damager chips in the gasket can be repaired. Now, remember that word can be. So you have to have a, a written procedure from your manufacturer on what is allowed when doing a structural repair. I would consider that a structural repair because as Jason mentioned, it had some exposed reinforcing. So you don't wanna just throw a patch on there. And it also, if I remember right, it kind of went into the where the joint would seal a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you can see it kind of <laughs> bled into where your gasket is going to seal. But it does say right there that the total damage has to be no more than 50% of the structure and no individual damage can be more than 25%. So if repaired properly, according to Ashto, uh, if you have the proper procedures in place, you can repair that one. And then if you remember, I talked about a uh, the chart. So if that was a, let's say that was a 24 inch pipe, you go across there, you can't have more than 37 inches total in length or one area more than 19. So I'm gonna assume none of those uh, lengths were longer than a 25%. All right, I think we have one more. Here we go. And this is a good example of at least putting something in there. With that pen there, it gives you a decent idea, not a perfect idea, but a decent idea of what that crack is. 
compared to, could you imagine if that pin's not there, you would have absolutely no clue. Is that on a 96 inch pipe and zoomed in five times? Is it on a 12 inch pipe and you're seeing the entire pipe? So let's, this will be interesting. I'm, I'm excited for this one. Okay, let me uh, throw it up here. Okay, it has been launched. All right, we'll see what uh, what people think on this one. Okay, we'll give it just another second here. And uh, all right, looks like most have voted. Oh, a couple more coming in. And I will close now. Okay. Looks like, Mike, um, more than half, 60% said acceptable, 14% uh, said repairable, and 28% said reject. Awesome. Well, one last time you're in the spotlight. What do you say, Mr. Allen? I would say I, I would say that that is acceptable. And um, my reasoning is uh, what I know about, you know, specifications and things with ASTM C76, anything under a hundredth of an inch crack uh, is considered acceptable. And I, I would consider that to be a hairline less than a hundredth inch crack. All right. Let's see what the answer shows. So the answer I'm going to give you, this was kind of a trick question. Um, I would, if I had this picture given to me from a contractor or a salesman, I would probably have said exactly what Jason said based off of um, my history and my knowledge of, of cracks. But the reality is, if this is the only picture that was sent to me and I had to write a letter and put my name and stamp on it, I don't know that I could without getting a little more detail. I would like to go back and get one of those crack gauges and put it up to that crack and see if it is smaller than an 01 crack. Because you would sure hate to say, oh yeah, that product's good because I'm gonna assume it's less than an 01 crack and come to find out it was much larger than an 01 crack. So I, I would either say you, you need more information or I've even written letters sometimes that say something to the effect of referencing the Ashto R73. If this is below an 01, it's acceptable. And then it would be up to that field inspector to look at it closer and or give me another picture. So that was kind of a trick question, uh, but it gets you thinking at least. It makes you think about how you look at these products and evaluate them and, and what do you do to send pictures uh, back to engineers so that they can take a peek and see what they think. And then this is part of the, this is part of the code that talks about the crack. Is any continuous crack having a surface width less than 01 if it does not pass through the wall is acceptable, period. We know if it's less than 01, and this is what you were saying, Jason, as long as it doesn't go through the whole entire wall, it's acceptable, you don't need to worry about it. And I'm excited for you to talk a little more of why that is here in just a minute. So with, with that being said, that's a quick, quick overview of R73. Um, as mentioned, it was written and approved by ASHTO DOT engineers. It's a national standard. It's technically correct and objective. Uh, it provides consistency and evaluation, which to me is the most important thing. Anything, whenever I do something as an engineer, I always try and look for consistency. If you can be consistent in what you do and how you evaluate different products and different, um, different pipe, different whatever you have, then it's not objective anymore. You know, you're, you're not putting your emotions and feelings into maybe that job you are literally just taking the code for what it is and you're evaluating it with a consistent eye. So that's what I like to what I like to try and do as an engineer and I hope that's what you guys all do as well. So with that being said, you can take the next half and bring it home. Perfect. I appreciate it. All righty. Oh, I'm having a little bit of an issue here. Let me pull this screen from you here. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Let's see if that works. So, oh. asked if I wanted to share my screen, and I said yes, and then it disappeared on me. So I don't think I'm showing my screen yet, am I? No, yeah. I just see the yeah. home page. Okay. 
Let me try one more thing. Try to be too clever sometimes switching this back and forth, you know? So <laughs> how about now? It looks like you should be seeing, yes, it looks like there that's it. Go. Okay. So uh, yes, we are going to talk about uh, another national specification. One that um, actually is a little bit near and dear to my heart because I was actually part of the ASTM C13 committee. C13 is a committee that is in charge of all of the ASTM specifications with uh, concrete pipe. And so I sit on the, the committee, I sit on C13, I am a voting member. I'm able to vote on the changes to these specifications. I'm able to give feedback. And I actually was one of the people that helped give feedback and helped write certain sections of this specification. So uh, I, I was really excited to see when I first started uh, in 2016, uh, we got this we got this thing up and running. We had a big uh, meeting about it in the end of 2016. It was in December of 2016 in Orlando, where we had a lot of uh, information and feedback go out. We came back and fixed it and modified a bunch of things in 2017, and this was adopted uh, in ASTM specs in the end of 2017. And so uh, this has been in uh, in effect for about four years now, so it's relatively new as far as certain ASTM specs, considering you know ASTM C76 and those are uh, 50, 60 years old, some of them. Uh, but this is a relatively new spec, so I'm excited to talk about it today. Uh, one thing that I do want to point out first is the concrete cracks. That is a fact. And also, uh, as I put that up, I know every one of you said fact in Dwight Schrute's voice. I just that's uh, that's also a fact. So we know that concrete cracks. That's it's natural. We we understand that that's going to happen. So there are things that we do to concrete to to make sure that it cracks either how we want it to or where we want it to or in a controlled fashion. So uh, when you're paving your driveway or your sidewalk, we put in, um, you know, we'll, we'll put in, we'll put in uh, gaps of things that where we want it to, where we want it to, to crack, right? We will try to, we'll try to challenge it. That's the reason why when you see sidewalk, you, you see, you know, some joints uh, put in there so that it'll crack along those joints. In, they're typically about every four feet. You don't want a sidewalk that's 20 feet long without a without any any uh, cold joints or any uh, any other joint lines that we could try to get it to crack along because you would just have so many cracks in there. So we want to control that cracking in sidewalks and driveways and different things. Um, in concrete pipe, we try to we try to limit that and in precast structures by putting steel in. So these are things that we can do to ensure that these cracks are not significant and that we can we can accept those. So. Uh, the impetus of, of this national specification was simply because we felt like we needed a national spec that would help give guidance to engineers and inspectors on what is acceptable and what is not. And so uh, this is a, a great specification that I'm really excited about sharing. Now, Mike mentioned that, that either one of these, the R73 or, or C1840, we could take a whole hour talking about these. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to go through relatively quickly. Um, some of it is a review of things that we've done in previous presentations. Uh, we've talked about some of this stuff in like our August uh, presentation and in our uh, October presentation that was about frequently asked questions. So uh, some of this will be a review for those of you that have attended all of them. If you haven't, I suggest you go back and watch those ones as well, because we'll be giving a little bit more detail into some of these uh, some of these things. Also, our, our basics of reinforced concrete pipe about cracking and different things. So make sure you go back and watch all of them so that you can, this should just be a high level overview for many of you. Okay, so the, the actual specifications name is standard practice for inspection and acceptance of installed reinforced concrete culvert, storm drain and storm sewer pipe. Kind of a long name, I understand. Uh, I wasn't in charge of coming up with the name. I would have called it something really cool, like, um, like uh, radical specification or awesome spec or read this now because it's going to blow your mind but um good thing i wasn't put in charge of putting coming up at the title i was just uh looking at some of the content in there so um so the sections of this specification i'm gonna there are eight different sections in it you've got the scope uh the reference documents that and terminology those are all standard in astm specifications and then the significance of use it talks about where to use it and and, and why it's significant um, and then it gets into, it even gets into the inspection equipment and the procedures and the recommendations on how you should be, be inspecting these pipes. It talks about the equipment and operator accuracy verification, which I'm going to talk about in a moment as well. Uh, it talks about the inspection report requirements, what you should include in a report. So if you're going to adopt a, a program where you have reporting on there, this gives recommendations on how you should do that. It, and then aid is really where the, where I'm I'm real interested in. And I think a lot of inspectors and engineers are interested in. This talks about the the evaluation and acceptance criteria of pipelines 
that are already installed. So, you know, Mike talked about those that before they get installed, this is all about pipelines before they get installed. So a couple of definitions before we get too far into it, because I'm going to be throwing out some acronyms and different things. I want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So if I say NASCO, that is the National Association of Sewer Service Companies. Um, so NASCO, uh, sewer service companies, this is, they have a, some certifications. I am PACP certified. This is your pipeline assessment certification program. Um, and all CCTV operators, uh, there. This is this is a program that, that teaches them how to code defects in pipes. So when they're going through a, a pipe and they're doing this an analysis, uh, they are. This is the the coding that they use. Okay, is NASCO's PACP uh, coding. And so I I went and took the three day. Uh, course and the test and I got NASCO PACP certified uh, you can get it actually takes two days to be PACP certified and then there's a MACP which is um, your uh, manhole assessment certification program and then you have LACP which is lateral assessment uh, certification program so you can be you can be uh, the the longest one is the two days is the PACP and then the MACP and LACP take about a half a day um, and then I'll also mention and reference CCTV which is your closed circuit television and that is uh, what the remote inspection cameras use, okay? Um, the great thing about this ASTM C1840 specification is that a lot of these specifications, it's just a bunch of words. And so you have to uh, identify and try to evaluate and, and understand what the words mean. The great thing about 1840 is that it provides a lot of pictures, right? And so it shows you different different things. So for instance, uh, figure one talks about if, if, if it's a large diameter pipe and you have person entry inspection, it shows how you do that, where you can measure different things and, and how you get in a large diameter. Figure two there shows remote inspection camera and how that looks. Figure three, the calcium carbonate filled crack. Figure four talks about the clock positions, 12, 3, 6, 9, so that it, it, it gives you, it, it tries to eliminate as much of the guesswork as possible. That was a big deal that we wanted to incorporate because there are very few ASTM specs that actually have, they'll have figures and different things, but not very many have full color pictures. And we wanted, to, we felt like this couldn't do service without full color pictures. So that's why those are in there. Uh, this is another picture of a CCTV uh, inspection camera. Some things to watch for, and Mike mentioned some of these, but one that's really important is to ensure that the camera is in the middle of the pipe. This is what the spec talks about. It wants you to make sure it's in the middle because if it's it, because these wide angle lenses, if it's too far up or down, it could distort the image as it as it uh, pans around the the pipe. So you want it to be as close to the center as possible. Uh, Mike talked about be aware of zooming. As they zoom in, it may look a lot bigger. A fracture that is that is minimal or under say five hundredths of an inch could look like, as Mike mentioned, the Grand Canyon. Uh, the other thing is some of these some of these operators they've gone through the pacp certification program but sometimes you don't just want to take everything that they say is gospel you want to watch the video you want to go in and look at the the analysis itself just to see the coding in the report and and the severity that they give it you're going to want to double check because it may be more or less severe than they than they say when these operators go through uh keep in mind that most of these operators that are doing this are not licensed engineers they are uh they're just technicians and so you may want to go back if you're if you're you know stamping something i wouldn't just take it on a picture and that brings up a good point mike mentioned um you know they give you a vid an image and say write me a letter on this image i i will not write a write a, a, a letter on just a, a picture i have to watch the video i i always want to watch the video because the video can tell i need to know were they zooming in uh how big is the diameter of the pipe what is going on there so these are things where images are good to give a snapshot but if you're if you're putting your stamp on it you definitely need to watch the video okay uh this is the manual that you get when you do the pacp certification program so this is the this is my manual here on the floor of my office that i took as you can see it is a uh not an insignificant <laughs> binder there this is like a three inch binder and this that's a lot of pages and a lot of examples and things and you go through all of these different codes and how to codify and it's a great resource to for all these pictures and different things of of, of different pipes and and cracks and different different uh codes that they give you so just a few of the nasco codes and i'm going to go through these quick because i could literally i mean keep in mind i'm condensing two days of training into about 30 seconds here but some of the more common codes that you'll see as you review these videos and these reports is you'll see c for crack which is longitudinal circumferential multiple spiral hinge um, fractures 
uh, broken pipe or soil is visible or is void visible joints. They'll have offset, separation, angular, infiltration. Is it a weeper, a dripper, a runner, or a gusher? Those are very technical terms that are in the NASCO PACP uh, certification guide there. So weeper, dripper, runner, or gusher. Um, the other one is vermin. There's a there's a vermin section. I always thought this was funny. And there's only three options, rat, cockroach, or, cockroach or other. So uh, I guess they see a lot of rats and cockroaches in a lot of a lot of storm sewer and sewer pipes so that's what they're they're classifying rat cockroach or other um when you look at the difference between you saw in their crack and fracture you may say well what's the difference what's a crack what's a fracture so nasco defines a crack as a break line visible on the surface but it is not visibly open so there's no gap visible between the edges of the crack and while and a, a fracture is where that it's it's opened up and you can actually see a gap between uh, the walls there. The pipe wall is all still still in place. It doesn't move. That would be broken if it's moving and displaced and out of place. But for a fracture, it's just it's open wide enough that you can actually see, or it's offset just slightly where you can actually see the wall in there. A crack is one where it isn't visibly open and there's no gap. Okay. Um, so keep that in mind when we talk cracks and fractures. Um, when you have the definitions of cracks and fractures, so C is the 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 code for crack and f is for fracture so you'll have like a cl is a longitudinal and this is uh lengthwise or parallel to the center line of the pipe circumferential would be cc which is a circular pattern or parallel to your joints uh cm would be multiple this is a combination of intersecting longitudinal and circular uh cracks a spiral is it changes position as it travels along the pipe a lot of times we'll see that as like a broken spigot or bell where the crack goes longitudinal and then it kind of heads around circumferential and then comes back to the joint so it almost uh, does kind of a, a half a half moon uh you know arc around the, the the spigot and bell of the pipe that would be a spiral crack and then um then a hinge crack is is basically more than one longitudinal crack at the same footage so if you're looking in a pipe and there's a crack at at the uh the maybe it's at the top of the pipe and at the bottom of the pipe or it's at the spring line on both sides that would be a hinge and you can have either two hinge cracks on the sides, two on one on top and bottom would be two. If there could be three where, where there's one on top, bottom and side, or there's um, uh, both, or there could be four, all of them. Now, sometimes when there's water or debris in the bottom, you can't see there's one on the bottom. You might assume that there is, but you would have to only code on what you see. So that would be, if you see it on the top and the sides and then there's water on the bottom and you can't see a crack, that would be a, a CH crack hinge and then you would put the code three next to it so you could visibly see three different hinge cracks there um so this is from the astm c 1840 these are examples that they give this is a longitudinal crack as i mentioned it runs along the the barrel of the pipe it's parallel to the uh, to the pipe itself to the flow of the pipe uh this is an example of a circumferential crack that goes around the pipe um this is parallel to the joints so it's not parallel it's perpendicular to the axis of the pipe uh, this is an example of a uh, of multiple uh, longitudinal cracks, and these are the hinged cracks. As you can see, that you you can see cracks actually at three and nine, and at twelve o'clock. But then, because of the water in there, we can't see on the bottom. So that would be a CH3. Um, this is a multi-directional crack. This, as you can see, is a longitudinal crack coming into a circumferential crack. It also gives uh, examples of of infiltration. So this is like your your weeper, your your gusher, your runner. So a weeper is one that just barely comes in. Um, there's also codification for staining on the pipe and different things. Um, as you can see, you've got your, uh, in down on the bottom of the page there, you've got that one on the right-hand side that's a gusher that's like actually spraying in. It's under pressure and it's spraying in. And then the one next to it is a runner. That's just running water coming down, but it isn't actually forcefully being pushed in. That would be a gusher. Okay, so you got gusher, runners, and, and weepers on this picture here. Um, it also has other pictures for staining and, and slabbing and, and minor spalling at joints and joint offset separations, different things there. Um, this is a picture on a video that I reviewed one time, and I bring this up because this is an interesting one. This is a circumferential crack near a joint, but if you look closely, you can actually see a white effervescent material around in the circumferential crack. And it's important that we talk about this because this is referenced in the specifications. And when we talk about acceptance criteria, it comes up. All right. Now we did talk about this in both our, I mentioned this is one of the things, one of the topics we talked about in August and October. So this will be a very high level review of this. All right. Um, this, this phenomenon is called autogenous healing. The specifications, including C1840, call this, they refer to it as calcium carbonate filled pipe. Okay. 
Uh, this autogenous healing is the ability of concrete to heal itself in the presence of moisture and seals the cracks. Now, when I first heard about this, I'll admit I was a little bit skeptical because uh, mainly because Randy Wallen was the one telling me and I'd never know if he's playing a joke on me or if he's being serious. So I had to, I had to look into it for myself. I'm that kind of person where I'm not just gonna take someone's word, I'm gonna look into it. So here's the science that I discovered as I, as I researched this. Basically what happens is you have free calcium oxide in cement and this calcium hydroxide is liberated when the tricalcium silicate in cement is hydrated, okay? So once it gets in, in the presence of water, you're, you're hydrating the tricalcium silicate and all of a sudden you've got calcium hydroxide is liberated from the cement itself. Now there's a, a minimal amount of carbon dioxide in air, in the soil, in water. Okay, and so what happens is this carbon dioxide, minimal as it may be, it actually carbonates the calcium oxide and calcium hydroxide that has been released. So you've got your free calcium oxide in the cement and your calcium hydroxide that was liberated from the tricalcium silicate. And, and that uh, cal carbonates that and it creates these calcium carbonate crystals or limestone, and then it seals in the crack. And this will work up to um, typically up to a hundred, uh, five hundredths of an inch crack. Uh, it, it's been known to work in heavier or, or wider cracks in the right situation where there's where the water's standing and there's there's more free calcium oxide in the cement than uh, than typical. So it can go even larger than that, but you definitely don't want to bank on it going. You know, if it's bigger than a five hundredth inch crack um, when it's in the ground and in the presence of moisture there. Okay, so I, I know all my chemistry nerds out there. I loved water chemistry. That was one of my favorite classes in my master's degree. So uh, here is the formula for those of you that are nerdy like me, right? You've got your calcium, calcium hydroxide that mixes with your carbon dioxide, right? It carbonates it and you, the result is your calcium carbonate and, and water. So that is your chemical reaction formula. You're welcome. Uh, this is a picture of some, this one's actually a great one. It, it's very pronounced and you can see that the calcium carbonate crystals are actually coming out of the crack. So not only did it seal it, but you can actually see it's coming coming out and, and over the side of it. So that's kind of a cool, cool picture in a large diameter pipe that we were able to get. Um, so uh, if you're skeptical and saying, okay, yeah, sure, I get it. I get the science, it understands. I understand that it, it it, it works, that makes sense. But how long does this take really? I'm still a little bit skeptical. So that was my question. I decided to do an experiment. If you if you don't find the answer you, you need and it's not satisfactory and there's a large range, I wanna see it for myself. How long does it take? So we did an experiment um, as part of the Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association about four years ago in one of our plant tours. What we did is we took a pipe. Um, this one was a 24 inch class three pipe. We cracked it. We took it to ultimate load actually. So this was a big crack. We wanted it to be five hundredths of an inch and see if we could get it to seal. And then we cut it in half, all right? And one of them we filled up, it was about, it was after about a month, right? It had filled for about a month and you can see the one in the foreground in this picture. That one's been filled, um, I think at the time I took this picture, our first tour was about three weeks. So that's why the picture before said three weeks. This one was at about one month, right? It had healed. So you can see it's still weeping a little bit of water, but that, and it's still leaking a bit, but you can see the calcium carbonate that is forming in there. And then the other one in the, in the, in the background there, that is one that we just filled up the water that day. Okay. So that morning we filled it up to the top and we just, and we kept a hose in there to keep it filled. Right. So one had taken about a month to heal. And at the time when we did this, um, the healed pipe was, this is a picture of a plant tour of us doing it. The healed pipe was, was uh, leaking at about one inch every two hours. Okay, but the non-hilled pipe, that the one that we filled up that morning, was leaking at two inches per minute. So after about a month, um, it had it had gone from two inches per minute on the first day to one inch every two hours. So it was it wasn't completely sealed, but keep in mind we we took it all the way to a five hundredth of an inch. We left it on site, we left it there, and within about three months, I went back and I noticed it was completely healed. So uh, there was no water leaking out after three months. So that's not bad for a five hundredth inch crack. All right, so. I was still a little bit skeptical, okay? So then skeptical engineer, Jason says, now wait a second though, wouldn't that crack affect your pipe strength? Because you've already cracked the pipe and now it's got a crack in it. And even though it filled and it sealed the pipe, that's one thing, but what about the structure of the pipe? That's one thing that we're concerned about, right? So um, I have a little autogenous healing video that I wanna share with you. I'm hoping this works. Uh, I tried it before, but we're gonna try it here. So we're gonna play this video. It's really short. It's about an experiment, it's about 30 seconds. This is an experiment that I did in uh, at the Old Castle plant in Ogden. So I'll play this now.
One question the American Concrete Pipe Association often hears is why is minor cracking in concrete pipes okay? The answer is found in the principle of autogenous healing. Autogenous healing is concrete's ability to heal itself in the presence of moisture. The visual indication of autogenous healing is a whitish substance known as calcium carbonate. The American Concrete Pipe Association demonstrates the principle of autogenous healing in a test that shows calcium carbonate sealing a pipe's minor cracks after three days of the pipe being filled with water. Loads were tested and the cracked but healed pipe had gained an additional 23% strength after one month. Our results provide positive anecdotal evidence of autogenous healing's speed and strength, and evidence that minor cracking poses no threat to the soundness of concrete pipes. Okay, so hopefully that uh, that worked out well and you guys could all see that and hear that. Um, if you weren't able to, you can watch that video. Some people have trouble hearing uh, the video and seeing it. So if you weren't able to see it, that can be found on, on YouTube. Um, it's just on, if you just look up uh, autogenous healing on YouTube, it should pop right up. Um, but here's a summary if you weren't able to hear what, what it said. Uh, the healing started within three days. We started noticing the calcium carbonate. After one month, it was fully healed and uh, there was no leaking at all after one month. So uh, our initial deload test, we cracked it to about three hundredths of an inch is how far we took the crack. Okay. After it was healed, we placed it in the deload machine, which is extremely difficult to place it at approximately the same orientation in the deload. We marked it on the pipe where it was. We got it as close as possible. And then we loaded it and it cracked actually at a different location. So uh, the, the, the crack where it was, instead of being weaker, it actually, the calcium carbonate binding to that was stronger than the, than the pipe itself. So it cracked in a different location. So the concrete was, was not as strong as the calcium carbonate. Um, now, the, uh, our, we looked at our numbers there and we noticed that it handled 23% more loading a month after we cracked it. So um, this, this actually, as, as concrete continues to cure and we wanted to make sure that the calcium carbonate that, that filled the crack wasn't the weak spot, we found out it wasn't and it actually got stronger over time. So um, let's jump back into the spec now that we understand uh, the, the calcium carbonate uh, filled pipe and autogenous healing. But inside this, this is the, like I said, this is the meaty part of the, the spec that we really wanted to focus on. Mike talked about acceptance and different things. I wanted to focus on that as well. Installed pipeline evaluation and acceptance criteria, section eight, very important. That's what everybody asks. So what, what is acceptable per this spec? So let's go through that real quick. This is, these are cracks that, are, that don't require any remediation. All right, so this is it. Now, there's some that, are, that exceed this. They recommend that you get an engineer's recommendation or an engineer's letter on how to repair it. They don't give any actual repair methods. Keep in mind, this is not a, a, a you know, a, an operational spec on how to, how, to, how to fix this. It's just what is acceptable, what is not, what needs an engineer to evaluate, what needs a manufacturer to evaluate, what, need, what, what needs to be rejected. So um, if you look at this, this is the acceptance criteria. This is the important part here, all right? So longitudinal cracks that are less than five hundredths of an inch wide and up to the entire pipe segment in length in a non-corrosive environment. So as long as you don't have hot soils and there's no corrosion, you, you'll be fine. Now, if it's under a hundredth of an inch crack, the, the pH of the soils and the water and everything is not even a factor. So you don't have to worry about that if it's less than a hundredth of an inch. But anything less than five hundredths of an inch in a non-corrosive environment, that is acceptable for the simple reason that we just talked. Anything up to five hundredths of an inch, it will heal itself. And it's not structural at that point. Anything above that, could potentially be structural and it may not heal. Okay, circumferential cracks less than a tenth of an inch in width, including the full circumference of the pipe. Now, this is obviously contingent upon whether the pipe needs to be watertight, soil tight, seal tight. If it needs to be watertight and it's leaking significantly, then that may need to be, you know, your your individual specs may say, well, we, we need it to be watertight. It's leaking. We need we need you to seal it. So that is subject to that. But as far as a structural, structurally in this pipe, Anything, a circumferential crack less than 10 or a tenth of an inch, not a hundredth, but a tenth of an inch is acceptable. Okay. And a multi directional cracks that are filled with calcium carbonate. So if it's filled, if it's already filled with calcium carbonate and you're seeing that and it's not, so though anything less than tenth of an inch is acceptable. So that is, that's if it's already filled. So it could fill up to that, but if it's a little bit more than five hundredths of an inch, then you want to, you know, if as long as there's calcium carbonate in there or calcium carbonate in there, you're fine. 
Okay, so that is the cracks part. What is acceptable and what, what you need to evaluate a little bit more. Anything, um, a longitudinal crack between five hundredths and a tenth of an inch needs to be evaluated by an engineer and anything greater than a tenth of an inch, you start getting into structural issues and we need to reject. And we'd need to either remove and replace or look at some other uh, some other options of, of strengthening that uh, joint sleeves uh, or grout sleeves, sleeving pipe, whatever we got to do to to strengthen that. Pouring the collar around it. There's a lot of different options that we could talk about, but but this spec doesn't get into that. Um, all right, the acceptance criteria for joints. This is another big one, right? There's two different types of joints that this evaluates: soil and silt tight joints, which is basically anything under the 200 sieve uh, could be allowed in. So anything greater than the number 200 sieve won't get through, that would be a silt type joint. Um, so this says that the gap, as long as the gap is less than the manufacturer recommendation, and um, if you have any crack, the crack widths are less than 10th of an inch or an offset of, of uh, three quarters of an inch, okay? So it has to meet both of those criteria. So it has to be less than a 10th at the crack of the joint. Um, it, if it allows entry of backfill particles, uh, less than the number 200 sieve, you're okay. Um, if there's chips or spalls, but no steel is exposed, you're still okay. Um, and then if there's a stain or level one or two infiltration, depending on what type of, of water is coming in, that's that's the important part there. And it will allow, if all of the others up above are met, you can still accept this if there's an exposed gasket or seal. Okay, it's still okay. if it's Even if the gasket's exposed, it would still be soil or silt type. All right. Um, now, now if we get into like leak resistant or watertight joints, this is a little bit different. Okay, there's a little bit difference here. Uh, as long as the gap is less than the manufacturer recommendation, and if there's any cracking, it has to be less than five hundredths of an inch. So if there's any cracking in the bell or spigot of the joint, it has to be less than five hundredths of an inch. The vertical or horizontal offset of any joint needs to be less than three quarters of an inch. Okay, so if your joint is a little bit shifted and up, it cannot it cannot be offset more than three quarters of an inch. If there are chips or spalls, those are okay. However, if there's any exposed gasket seals or steel, there's no guarantee that it's gonna be watertight. It could still be silt or soil tight, so that would be acceptable, but it will not be watertight. So it's not leak resistant. So that is, that is uh, those would be acceptable as long as there's no exposed gaskets or seals or steel. Okay. Um, another great part about this spec is that it has an inspection report requirement. So this, this tells you what you have to include in your inspection report. So if you're going to adopt a program and have inspection reports, this is a great recommendation on what those reports need to look like. All right. Um, great guidance that, that you need to include in your post-installation inspection report and, and from your inspection firms that are doing this. Like, for instance, location to the nearest 500, uh, 500 of an inch for length. Uh, to the nearest uh, hundredth of an inch for width, uh, your joint separation, how much of those, any other notable observations, and then they want a still image, they recommend a still image, and each image should reference the inspection video so that you can go back and see. As I mentioned before, you don't just want a picture, you want to be able to go back and watch the video, so it has to reference that video. Um, so I'm going to close here with just my recommendations for uh, ASTMC 1840 and how you could use that as an engineer. Um, first of all, my recommendation is that you adopt a, a post-installation inspection program uh, if you haven't already, and I would recommend using ASTMC 1840 as a guide. This is a great guide that says this is what our national specification says is acceptable. So as long as it's it's within this is the acceptance program, go with that. Um, I would then say if you need to modify it as necessary per project per, or municipality, if you have more strict specs or, or if you want to give more detail and guidance on what repair methods are acceptable, that's where I would, I would recommend that. But this is a really good rule of thumb on what is acceptable and what needs additional, uh, additional repair or additional uh, recommendations on how to, how, to, how to look at that from a, from a licensed engineer. Um, another recommendation that I have is, is look into the NASCO PACP certification. I think it's it was a great program for me to understand and learn. I thought it was fantastic. So uh, that is those are my recommendations. Adopt a PII program, and based on what Mike said too, you should probably adopt a, a pre-installation inspection program also uh, per Ashto uh, R73. So uh, that's all I've got. I know we've got a couple of questions here that we're going to get to. Um, so this is our contact information, and while I leave this up on the screen, I'm going to answer. Uh, we'll go through some of these questions here. Um, so uh looks like we had someone who just said thanks for the the first question is uh thanks for the presentation they had to jump off the call at, at uh, one o'clock and we went a little bit long which was expected because we gave we basically condensed two or three hours of presentation into an hour so 
Um, you're welcome, Dave. I appreciate you, you joining us. This was a great presentation. So um, any other any other questions anybody has, you can uh, type them in now uh, and, and we'll we'll hang around a bit. Mike, any any closing remarks, anything that you would recommend? I gave my recommendations. You gave a recommendation to adopt Ashto R73 as a in their uh, pre-installation program. Anything that uh, I maybe missed that you want to add? You know, the only thing I think I would add is just, um, you know, you're, you're going to pay for what you get. I know a lot of people struggle, especially right now with labor and, and the, you know, where we're at right now as a society with, with finding good labor and, and backlog of products, but ultimately you'll pay for what you get. Um, you know, if you, if you take the extra time and you pay to have some inspection done of a product, you're probably going to get a better product in the long run, no matter what that product is at home or as an engineer you know if you go buy a brand new car and you, you probably are going to look at it before you buy it and make sure right. it's all all good so that that's right. really all i'd say is you'll, you'll pay for what you get hey here's a great question that just came in um where are these specifications available can they be downloaded or do you have to purchase them that's a great question i will let you speak to ashto r73 and then i will speak to astm so the R73, you can go back in my uh, presentation. There's actually a link you can click on. Well, you'd have to, I guess, copy it. And, well, you wouldn't even copy and paste it. You'll just have to retype it in. But I, I think it might be free for download, but don't, uh, don't quote me on that. I will actually, I'll try it as Jason does his, but you can download that. Okay. Um, keep in mind that is, I think it's part of another, well, in addition to ASTM C 1840, there's also uh, Ashto uh, LRFD, the design manual that has like section 27 is all about like concrete pipe and or, or concrete structures, uh, including pipe and box cover and that. And so I know that like Ashto LRFD to purchase that, I think it's like eight or nine hundred dollars or something like that to purchase the whole Ashto LRFD. Um, but as far as ASTM, and I don't think R73 is included in that. I think that's a separate thing that's the, the as Mike said, I think it is available to download astm specs are a little bit different uh astm specifications are for purchase only um if you needed to uh if if you needed a copy of it and you call me up and say hey jason can i have a copy of it i am not legally allowed to send you a copy anytime i download a specification to review because i'm on the committee it has my name on it when i downloaded it and if if uh if i was caught giving that out then i would be uh I would be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And it, you guys know me. Y'all know that I, I'm not going to do well in prison. So um, don't even <laughs> ask me for it. I, I just, that's just not me. You know, my, my ADHD would not allow me to have a successful prison sentence. So, um, so yeah, that the, the ASTM, you have to purchase those. Now, there are some options that are cost effective. Uh, there are certain books that you can buy that, that ASTM sells that are, you know, you don't need every single specification. So, you know, each spec costs about $90 to purchase uh, if you just want to buy one specification. Um, and ASTM understands. They say, well, we know that, that one spec, you know, they're going to be you know, you may need these specs. If you're focusing on concrete pipe, then you're going to need these, these, you know, 20 or 30 specs important. So they have bundles that are in books that you can buy a book for a couple hundred dollars that has, instead of just, you know, one spec for $90, you can buy it for, that have, you know, 20 or 30 specs related to concrete pipe for, for two or $300. So there are more cost-effective bundling options. Um, there's, when you join ASTM and you join a committee, you are allowed to choose which committee you want to sit on and which when you want access to the specs. Now, the purpose of that is to get access to the specs to review them and see if you want to, uh, if there are any changes that need to be made. So they're not necessarily for, they're not meant for private use. You're not supposed to just download them and use them and then, and then choose a different group to be a part of every year when you renew your membership and download all those specs. That's not the purpose of them. So so again, I, I can't stress this enough. If you join, don't just download all the specs and keep them on your server and use them for the future reference. That's not allowed, wink, wink. Um, but there are options that you can buy bundles and different things to, to help you see what these specs are. But yeah, unfortunately, ASTM specs, um, not allowed to give those out. You have to purchase those. So I just looked up the Ashto. If you're a member, it's $72. If you're not a member, it's 97. So it's not bad. Um, one thing we can do, if you're interested, uh, we can help you um, we have access to these specifications. Obviously, we we use them in our plants and in our 
in our association. If you are interested in looking at adopting a post-installation or pre-installation uh, inspection program, and you want to use some of this information, uh, there's nothing that says we can't glean some of the information and reference it and, and specify it with you and help you specify that. So we could pull some of the information out of here in these specifications and use those where we've already purchased them and uh and and be more detailed in your own individual specs to reference these things as well so uh you can just duplicate that information in your own and then it's available to everybody the, the hard part about some of these specs is if you reference it um we would hope that the contractor is buying them and having access to all of those but let's be honest in this climate when it's so uh busy and everybody's in a hurry they don't always necessarily study all of the specifications and take the time to buy them so we want to make it as easy as it can to make it available but uh, those are some of the things that you may need to consider. So that's really all I've got, Mike. Any anything else? Uh, that those are all the questions that came in. I think we covered everything. So that's it. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks, Mike, for your help. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to uh, to tag team and jump in and do presentations with you. Hope we answered all your questions. Feel free to shoot us emails at the uh, email addresses that I put up here. Uh, we would love to to work with you and help you out as much as we can. Uh, we look forward to to seeing you. Remember, end of the year. You've only got a couple more weeks to, to watch these presentations, so make sure you get them watched. Uh, Friday, December 31st they'll be, will be the last day you can watch those, so they'll be coming down on the 1st, won't be available anymore. So uh, keep that in mind. We look forward to, uh, uh, to seeing you in person the next time we can, and, and uh, you guys have a great, a great week, a week, great weekend, and if we don't see you before, have a very happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye, everyone.